Welcome back. Happy Thursday, everybody. It's Michelle here, your host on Soul Medication. And today we are going to continue going back, looking at scriptures that foretell about Christ's first coming, how he was born in Bethlehem. We read, heard, learned about that yesterday, about Bethlehem. We learned about him coming with a scepter, ruling with a scepter, so denoting some kingship there. Uh, and so today we are going to go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where it says, And I will put en enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise and tread your head underfoot, and you will lie in wait and bruise his heel. So the first thing we need to do is look at what's going on here. And we've been doing that. We kind of take a general synopsis of what is going on before we get this promise. So in the chapter, the third chapter of the whole Bible, we see the fall of man with sin in the Garden of Eden. And then God confronts the sin and the curses are handed out. We know that God had put Adam and Eve in the garden. He gave them specific instructions that they could eat from every fruit bearing tree in the garden, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We see in the beginning of the chapter that Eve was approached by this serpent who's so cunning and crafty. And I'm not sure quite what this creature was before he was made a serpent, but he's cunning and he's crafty. And he got Eve to eat some of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he gave her, she gave some to her husband and they both ate of it. Now this fruit eating this opened their eyes and they knew they were naked. They wanted to cover their nakedness and God had come down to walk with them and they were ashamed because of their nakedness. So they hid in first John two sixteen, it says for all that is in the world. And then we get this list of things that are in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. These do not come from the Father, but are from the world itself. So just as it says there, so a lust of the flesh, thinking of Eve's craving for sensual gratification, that the apple was good for food. So we've got the lust of the flesh, craving for that sensual gratification. And then the lust of the eyes, the greedy longings of the mind. This is Eve finding the fruit pleasing to the eye. And then the pride of life. This assurance in one's own resources or in the stability of earthly things, that if she ate the apple, she would become wise. So basically assuring herself of her own resources. Eve was tempted, but God provided a way out. It says so in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation, there's no trial regarded as enticing to sin, no matter how it comes or where it leads that has overtaken you or laid hold on you that's not common to man. That is no temptation or trial has come to you that's beyond human resistance. And that is not adjusted and adapted and belonging to human experience and such as man can bear, but God is faithful to his word and to his compassionate nature. And he can be trusted not to let you be tempted and tried beyond your ability and strength of resistance and power to endure. But with the temptation, he will always provide the way out, the means of escape to a landing place that you may be capable and strong and powerful to bear up under it patiently. Many years ago, I'd done a study on my own of Corinthians, and my Bible still marked with something that I learned from that study and something that really changed how I see temptation. The word for that way out, that landing place that, that, ta that Paul talks about, that God provides here when we are tempted, that is from the Greek word ekbasis. I'm not sure how to pronounce these Greek words and Hebrew words, but it's E-K-B-A-S-I-S. -S, and it means a way out of a mountain pass, but not as a means of surrender or retreat, but as a way of conquest in the grace and the power of God. This was a profound truth for me. 
And I hope that it provides a new, fresh look at this way out of temptation. Eve did not have to eat the fruit. She could have taken her way out, her conquest, and said, not today, Satan. I wonder if she was used, uh, used to hearing creatures talk in the garden. But regardless, this is the point that sin entered the world. And she gave the fruit to her husband. And now here is the thing. Eve was deceived. But we know from 1 Timothy 2.14 that Adam was not deceived. He did this knowing full well it was disobedience. I thought it was very interesting that as Romans 5 says, by one man sin entered the world and by another man salvation comes, that there's another parallel to look at here. We see the words, we hear the words, take and eat every time we take communion most ministers preachers pastors will say take and eat this is my body as a way to remember christ's body broken and how his blood was poured out for us to cover the sins from the very first take and eat so after they send god is looking for them and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden. And I'm reading from Genesis 3, starting at verse 9. And I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave me, whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me. He cheated, he outwitted, he deceived me and I ate. And then what does God do? He asked them some questions. And he starts with the first one. Where are you? I look at this as the beginning of separation between man and God. And David Guzik is a pastor and he has a wonderful commentary online called Enduring Word. And it's free and he writes the following. And I just wanted to capture this. I thought this was such a good caption of this situation here, this picture that we're seeing. He writes, this was not the interrogation of an angry commanding officer, but the heartfelt cry of an anguished father. God obviously knew where they were, but he also knew a gulf had been made between him and man, a gulf that he himself would have to bridge. The question was meant to arouse Adam's sense of being lost. The question was meant to lead Adam to confess his sin. The question was meant to express God's sorrow over man's lost condition. The question was meant to show that God seeks after lost man. The question was meant to express the accountability man had before God. And I just love this, I think, because if you had a childhood similar to mine growing up with an authoritarian father, you may not see this judgment thing as the heartfelt cry of an anguished father. You would not see a father who looks at the sin and then begins to plan a way for him to bridge the gap for that sin. I love what Charles Spurgeon writes. In our courts of law, we do not require men to answer questions which would incriminate them, right? They can plead the fifth, but God does. And at that last great day, the ungodly will be condemned on their own confession and guilt. There is no pleading the fifth when it comes to standing before God. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded that you should not eat? And then he says to the woman, what is this you have done? And then he turns to the serpent. What is the question for the serpent? If you wanna stop this and go look it up, I can wait. But it's a trick question because there is no question. He doesn't ask the serpent anything, but Satan is not going to learn anything here. He is pure evil. So here you have the background. Going into the verse we are going to talk about today. 
This is where God is now distributing the curses, the judgment for this sin. How is being deceived a sin? Because just as Romans said that exchanging the truth for a lie is a sin, this is what they did. In Genesis 3, verses 14 to 15, God curse brings his curse upon the serpent. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust for all the days of your life. Can you imagine being Adam and Eve and this creature that Satan used, probably mostly, you know, this beautiful garden creature, that he used to tempt Eve is now transformed from this beautiful creature in the Garden of Eden to a serpent, losing its legs. Whether they fell off or they just were absorbed into his body, I have no idea, but went from this creature with legs to now crawling and slithering away. They've just seen this curse brought on the creature and they're standing there waiting. They had to be next and they had to be frozen in fear. But we're still not done yet with Satan's curse. Because this is where the promise is coming. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. I don't know about you, but in general, most women are not fond of snakes. And that goes for some men too. Some men that I know. So not only have you lost your arms and legs, and now you must slither wherever you go, but people are not going to like you. Where I live, we have a few acres, and it's in a rural community. But we've noticed over the past few years, as we garden each year, we're seeing less and less black snakes. And in the south here, those snakes are good because they balance out the rodents and the copperheads. But people don't like them. They come, they build their big houses, raise their families, and they kill a snake when they see it because they don't like it. I used to be like that. I used to say the only good snake is a dead snake. But living on our little farmette, and especially this year when we ended up with a whole condominium of moles and voles and mice that had tunneled through our garden by the end of the season, we miss the snakes. Even though we hate them, they do serve a purpose. So even though God cursed that creature, it is very necessary in the circle of life. I found that a very interesting reflection as I thought about this promise that we're talking about, that God is so awesome that even under a curse, there is purpose. And then we come to the next part. And between your seed and her seed, remember we are talking enmity here. So the state of being actively opposed or hostile to someone or something, we didn't like them, right? We don't like him. There's a hostility and an animosity between between Satan and man. There's now an antagonistic idea, a fear of Satan. The cunning, smooth talker we saw that walked with her in the garden is now an enemy. Just as one is born in sin and must learn about God and move toward him and decide to follow him, one also would have to deny those feelings of enmity and animosity in order to move towards Satan and serve him. We're born rebellious, but there still is some natural aversion Towards Satan as well. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Here it is, the boom lowered on Satan with the first look, the first prophecy of his ultimate demise. And God is pointing to the conflict that will exist between the seed and the woman, the seed of the woman and Satan. We see here that Satan will inflict a wound on the Messiah, a mere bruise, but that The Messiah will have the final blow, bruising the head. And that is not just the heel, but a mortal wound to the head. Adam and Eve had just fallen into sin. The whole world changed. The whole dynamic between the creator and the created had changed. And after God is now, and God is now announcing that there is a plan. There's a way out. There's a deliverance for the consequence of sin through the seed of the woman. And notice it's not the seed of the man also. And here is a little Bible trivia for you today. What is so magnificent about this one promise or the first prophecy that we see here in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 3 is that Bible scholars call it the Proto-Evangelium or the first gospel. Spurgeon calls this the first gospel sermon that was ever delivered upon the face of the earth to Jehovah himself for the preacher and the whole human race and the prince of darkness for the audience. As God laid out the curses on his plan, he wanted something more than an innocent man in the garden. He revealed his plan for a man that was redeemed and a repair of the relationship. One who does not need to flee out of his sight because of sin, but one who can have direct fellowship with him through his seed. 
I hope that you're enjoying these looks at the scriptures and how they reflect the first coming of Jesus as we celebrate his birth. As always, if you are enjoying these podcasts, please subscribe, like, follow, share, and I hope to see you back here again tomorrow for another episode on soul medication.